Welcome everyone to the Everly Design webinar for Advanced Transportation Controller Cabinet Component Overview. So thank you for attending. Um, this is going to be a brief overview of the component level devices that go into a, the new ATC controller cabinet. So before we get started, I want to just uh, talk about some background material. First of all, if you're not familiar with the ATC cabinet architecture and what an ATC cabinet is, then some of the material or some of the detail in the webinar isn't going to make a lot of sense. So um, I've listed as a start here some links to download other information. Um, first of all, this webinar will be available later to review or download the printed material. It'll be on our ediTraffic.com website in webinars. We have all of the product catalog data sheets, operation manuals, software, all the detailed information that you're going to want to have also available at ediTraffic.com forward slash ATCC. That'll get you started into the um, documentation section. There is a very nice ATC cabinet overview that's been done both as a webinar and as an expert panel um, technical session at the last IMSA national conference. So I have links here to the cabinet overview webinar and also uh, the slides for the IMSA expert panel overview. So again, that's all material that I kind of assume that you've looked at or are familiar with before we get started into the devices. Um, this information will also be, uh, links to it will be on the uh, webinar toolbar that you can see on your screen if you want to uh, download those during the, the presentation. So I'll start with just a little bit of an overview about the cabinet. Um, picture here is, is uh, just one possible implementation, but the ATC cabinet architecture is based on ITS cabinet version one. That is a national public stand, published standard. The ATC effort is a working group, ITE sponsored working group that is developing a standard for this equipment. So it's kind of a lessons learned and let's add state-of-the-art technology to the fairly old ITS cabinet version one architecture. Um, quick run through of some of the attributes of the ATC cabinet. Why am I interested? Why would I want this? What does it do for me? First off, size is very important. Um, we use the term in this cabinet often of double density. So in many places where we used to do 16 channels of outputs, for example, we now can do double that, 32, in the same space or less. Um, input racks, where we used to do 24, we can now do 48 in the same space. So getting cabinet size down has been a priority or alternatively freeing up more space within our cabinet for other equipment, routers, fibers, uh, battery backups, things like that has become important. These cabinets are designed to increase technician safety and motorist safety uh, in the sense of touch safe, low voltage, uh, protected uh, technician protective equipment requirements, things like that. We've also added a number of state-of-the-art technology improvements. For example, the cabinet now has load current monitoring. So when a uh, vehicle approach goes dark, maybe the field wire just got cut, we detect that immediately. That's a safety enhancement. Um, we monitor the flashers. We have some advanced diagnostics within the cabinet when a malfunction occurs to help the technician figure out what happened, what's wrong, and what do I need to fix to get this cabinet running again. So another big point, and we'll talk about this, all of these in more detail, um, LED signal compatibility. Um, prior to this 
cabinet technology, NEMA style, Caltrans style, 10 amp track based load switches have struggled to be compatible with the new LED low power signals that we've been using for more than a decade. Um, we'll see that these new load switches will allow LED manufacturers to provide even lower power, what I call ultra low power signal heads that are getting going to get down into the one or two watt range very quickly. We're currently evaluating LEDs that are in the four to five watt range, so we're, we're on our way to get there. I'll mention as well this cabinet can operate in a conventional 120 volt um, system as we do now and we have a version that is designed for 48 volt low voltage operation to address some of the safety issues and efficiency issues and so forth. So to understand what we're going to focus on in the output assembly primarily and the monitoring system uh, again, a little background here. This cabinet is based on a serial bus architecture. So we have serial buses going between the controller, what I've called the ATC here, and SIUs, serial interface unit. SIUs are the ATC cabinet equivalent of a NEMA TS2 BIU. So it provides a translation from serial communications to parallel inputs and outputs. The ATC controller also talks to the monitor, the CMU. So that's the main cabinet serial bus one, again analogous to NEMA TS2 port one. We also have another bus that resides within the output assembly for the most part. The load switches are now intelligent devices where the voltage and current monitoring functions are built into the load switch rather than being part of the MMU. So the CMU, the cabinet monitor unit, gathers information from each individual, what I'm calling here HDSP, high density switch pack, collecting that information and then doing the monitoring function. In the block down below, we have the HDFU, the high density flasher unit. So again, those are communicating with the monitor so that we can um, tell and report if the flashers are failed or not working. And finally, the last block in the bottom right there is the ADU or the auxiliary display unit. This monitor is based on a modular concept where the um, display portion of it is a separate unit all connected via serial bus 3. Okay. So architecturally this is how the block diagram would look and we're going to see in a little more detail how all this uh, comes together by talking about each device. So this is kind of a quick list of the ATC cabinet components what we're going to talk about in this webinar the model 2202 is what we're calling the universal switch pack flasher unit. So quick note, the load switch, AKA switch pack and the flasher are now the same device. So they're interchangeable. We have the model 2212 cabinet monitor unit. We'll talk about that. The auxiliary display unit is the modular display unit for the monitor. We already mentioned the 2218 serial interface unit. That's kind of the uh, BIU function, SIU in this case. We have a couple of different formats for power supplies, 2216, 2217, and finally the model 2202 high density flash transfer relay. So let's talk about the load switches or the HDSP first because this is really the newest device within the cabinet. A um, couple noticeable difference, these are not housed in a giant aluminum chassis because frankly we don't need the heat dissipation that our triac based load switches have. So they're card based units. 
sort of a similar form factor to a common loop detector card. They have a DIN connector on them and each card has not one but two channels on it, six outputs. So each output is rated at one amp. So these are limited to LED loads only. They won't drive incandescent loads, but that's how we get the power down, the dissipation down, and the size down. So besides the lower rating, they use a FET transistor technology that's very efficient. So not only do we not dissipate heat, wasted energy on the card, but we, we also are able to drive the lower power LEDs. So on this board, besides the driver circuits to drive the signal loads, is the voltage and the current monitoring functions, the voltmeter and the current meter. So again, to monitor load current on each output, we need to be in series with the load, if you will. So it made sense to build it into the load switch itself. So again, each channel, each color is monitored for voltage and load current, and that's reported back to the, to the CMU monitor unit. Again, we're, we're very excited about the LED compatibility issue because that's been a problem for many years in standard NEMA three, or 332 cabinets. LED manufacturers have been holding back on lowering the power in their loads or in their uh, signal heads because if they get below about seven watts, they know that they're gonna have compatibility issues with standard load switches. So this device saves us some power in itself in wasted energy, but the big point is it allows LED signals to get down in the one to two watt range, maybe even less. This isn't the same uh, you know, factor of 10 or more that we got from going incandescent to LED, but it is another major decrease in power that's going to come to play when you start looking at solar power, wind power, and who knows what, um, but primarily battery backup systems. Um, the more efficient we can make these cabinets and the signal heads, the longer we can run an intersection without main power, run it off battery, and the fewer batteries we'll need. So there's also a number of built-in safeguards in here for dealing with multi-point malfunctions in a cabinet. For example, when the monitor detects a conflict or a clearance fault, anything that puts the cabinet to flash, the CMU sends a message to each load switch telling it to disable its outputs, regardless of what the controller is telling it to do. So this is not a revolutionary thing, but it is another level of safety. If you have a problem with an output turning on when it shouldn't, and the main contactor fails to open, we want to do everything we possibly can to avoid having green and yellow signals visible to the motorist while we're in flash. Okay, that's just a safety hazard for motorists and a lawsuit waiting for the agency. So we also have introduced some, what I've called here, ID indicators. They're blue LEDs on the load switches. They're used for many different purposes, but primarily when the CMU detects a fault, it'll illuminate those blue LEDs on the appropriate channels to help guide the technician to you know, the channel or the color where there's a problem to be diagnosed. So the flasher unit uses the same exact card, and, and I want to be clear, this picture that I'm showing of the cabinet is but one possible modular configuration of an ATC cabinet, but I think it demonstrates, one again, another big safety improvement. The flasher in this cabinet is located down in the what we're calling the service assembly. That's where your incoming power first gets attached to the cabinet, main circuit breakers, uh, transient protection, things like that reside. 
So basically, all other assemblies, outputs, inputs, controllers, everything except the field termination panel can be replaced in this cabinet while the signals are in flash. Okay. Clearly, if the flasher fails or the service assembly fails, we have to go dark. But all other assemblies in the cabinet can be replaced with power still going out to the signals in flash. So likewise, there's two channels, similar as the load switch function, there's two channels per card. Um, again, you can interchange, pull the flasher card out, plug it in the output assembly for a load switch, and likewise. So we have a little enhancement. We don't have to carry an inventory of separate flashers. We have but one device. Another important safety issue was the flasher alarm diagnostics. So I would venture today at this moment there are many cabinets out on the street where the flasher has been damaged or is not working correctly and nobody knows it. So when the day comes that that cabinet needs to go to flash, we'll be disappointed to find that all of the outputs aren't working correctly. That was a problem we wanted to solve. In this cabinet, if a flasher output fails, the CMU will detect that and generate an alarm to the controller stating that we have a maintenance issue with the flasher and somebody should come in and address that. So again, I'm trying to point out some of the, you know, some cases they're simple and other cases they're quite important, but improving cabinet level safety was a primary goal of this ATC cabinet design. So there's not much to do to install the, the load switch or the flasher. There's no programming. You plug it in. It knows its address, zero bus address, because it's hardwired into the connector pins. So depending on the position in the rack that the card gets plugged in, it adopts that address and starts communicating to the CMU. So the indicators on the front are uh, kind of set up for both flasher and load switch function, but basically you get a red, yellow, green indication of the input to the load switch, RXTX indicating zero bus three activity, and if this is in the flasher mode, um, there's blue LEDs that provide an indication of the flasher output voltages. Okay, And then we have the ID indicators to help for troubleshooting. All right, this is a picture of both the cabinet monitor unit. It's a plug-in card. And down in the bottom, a picture of the auxiliary display unit. So the two of these together provide most of the functionality that's in a conventional MMU type of monitor with the exception of the voltmeters and the current meters for measuring the field outputs. The CMU, a couple notable differences here, this CMU is capable of monitoring for 32 channels. So we're finding not so much that there are lots of intersections that are giant complex intersections needing 32 channels. We know that flashing yellow arrow eats up a lot of extra channels, but interestingly, an application for the 32 channel mode becomes closely spaced intersections all running on the same controller. So now you start requiring 20, 25, 30 different channels to support these multiple closely spaced intersections. All right, so we receive the data from each um, load switch and flasher on Sierra Bus 3. The monitor tries to make sense of that and determine if there are any fault scenarios going on that it has to respond to. To understand how to do that, we have to provide configuration programming to the monitor. So you can see from this picture, not real well, but that red slot is actually a data key device. We no longer have soldered wire jumpers or clipping diodes or that kind of nonsense. 
we program the configuration of the monitor using a interchangeable data key. It's nothing more than a non-volatile memory that's housed in a little plastic key-shaped device. And we'll, we'll see more of that when we talk about the software. So <clears throat> programming becomes easy when you take out the monitor and maybe you're replacing it, you're testing it, you're doing something. When you plug in that key and lock it in, you program all of the functionality of the monitor including the network parameters of the Ethernet port. Now the display unit below is what we use to provide, there's a bank of LEDs, 32 channels of red, yellow, green, and blue. So you have kind of a LED status of what all the field signal outputs are doing. We have the colored LEDs on the load switches themselves to know what the inputs are doing. And then to the right of that, there's a small LCD display with some menu-driven functionality <clears throat> Excuse me, that allows you to view event logs, configuration, um, status from the monitor, and it provides an interface to our EDI smart monitor technology. This is the diagnostic wizard. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a further slide. So again, each output of the load switches reports a load current to the monitor. Um, load current monitoring is something that really provides um, more benefit than meets the eye. It does provide a safety monitoring issue in a voltage only monitoring system like NEMA or Caltrans 332. We detect a no load, but we do it only by virtue of load switch leakage current, and we don't, we're unable to detect a no-load condition at the time of the fault. We have to wait for that channel to cycle to the next color. So load current monitoring provides really, I think, three major benefits. One, if we lose a load, the monitor detects it immediately. We don't have to wait for the signal to cycle. That may be very important on a rural intersection where you may be in side street red for hours or days even. Um, voltage and current gives us a power measurement so the monitor now has a more confident um, idea of whether that signal is actually on or not. And finally the monitor has a way to differentiate between a true no load condition and a shorted on condition. In a NEMA MMU, a red no load is detected by the monitor as a red green dual indication. Well, that's pretty or can be very confusing to a technician because that's the same exact result that a shorted red green um, malfunction would produce. Therefore, the technician's got to figure out which case do I have and alter his troubleshooting techniques appropriately. Now the monitor is going to tell him very directly, it is an O-load, it is a signal on, it's a signal off. He'll have a very good idea going into the process what he's actually looking for. Okay, the built-in diagnostic wizard is something that we'll display on the ADU. The diagnostic wizard brings up a did the controller drive this function, or was it what we call a field problem, meaning something in the load bay or the field wiring has failed? A load switch has failed, wiring is shorted, that kind of a thing. So it directly tells the technician, do I have a cabinet problem, or do I have a controller problem? That kind of divides things in half. If it's something related to the cabinet or the cabinet wiring or components, it will go on to identify the color and the channels that are in fault and it will provide some what I call tips to the technician for some suggested troubleshooting activities. The hard part of using the diagnostic wizard for some will be bringing themselves to push that help button. Nobody ever wants to push the help button. They can, if they can avoid it.
So I think in this case, you might be surprised and be well rewarded. Finally, the CMU provides all of the same ECCOM software support. It's a full event logging monitor, so we have intersection status, field terminal voltages, field terminal load currents. We get historical logs, and we get the beloved signal sequence log. The signal sequence log is what I call TiVo for your traffic cabinet, so it allows you to go back and look at the all 32 channels of signal states for 30 seconds prior to the fault event. This can provide a lot of great assistance if there's a timing issue, preemption issue, intermittent issues, things like that, because we can see exactly what the monitor saw as the intersection was cycling prior to the fault. So for those using EDI monitors today, um, this will become very this will be very familiar. It's the same software, same functionality applied to the 2212 monitor. So let's talk a little bit about how we program this data key to configure the CMU. Number one, there is a programming tool that we provide, the little black box on the bottom right. It's about the size of a deck of cards. It connects to your PC using a USB interface, and you plug the data key device into that programming tool, and that's how we write and read from the key. So the monitor key software comes up with a form, or a window if you will, for each monitoring function. And we're going to go in with our mouse and click checkbox and type in text and things like that to program the monitor for each monitoring function. So rather than getting your soldering iron out and soldering jumpers or getting your clippers out and clipping diodes and flipping dip switches, all those 20th century type of programming tools we're going to use a PC, a mouse, and set it up such that it's just data. So as we go through all the detail of these forms, we're not going to do it in this webinar. Um, I have a separate one that describes in more detail how you actually derive the configuration. But essentially, we're just developing a database of configuration parameters for the monitor it's written to the key and then when we insert the key into the CMU the CMU reads that data and acts on it. So we can do a lot of things that you might expect. We can read a key, we can write a key, we can copy a key, we can save these configuration files on our PC disk, we can email them, whatever you might want to do. Um, and again in more detail of how the monitor key software works, a nice feature of this is we can load what I call templates for data sets that you may have already developed. For example, you could load a typical, let's say an eight phase quad configuration. If that is the proper configuration, you write it to the key and you're ready to go. If you need to make some subtle tweaks, maybe you're not using a channel or a ped, you could make some simple adjustments, write it to the key, and then you're ready to go. I'll mention as well that there is a built-in setup wizard in this software, so there are some parameters that you must enter manually. You must, for example, um, enter the conflict matrix, the permissive programming of the monitor, because that's based on the geometry and timing ring structure of the intersection, we can't really automate that. You fill that in. Other forms we're going to generate automatically, so you have to fill in the forms that kind of describe how the cabinet is wired, sort of a, a, a phase to channel overview, and then you invoke the setup wizard and it will develop much or the majority of the very detailed parameters red-green dual indication, field check, load current output enables, 
all of the minutia of detail that the CMUs required to function correctly. So I would strongly encourage you to use the setup wizard, take advantage of it, and um, again, I think you'll be surprised at the amount of work and thinking, if you will, that it, it saves you. So again, there's an overview of the Monitor Key programming tool on our website. It has a lot of speakers text associated with it. If you have more specific questions on how to program the key, how to work the tool, that would be the place, um, place to go. So a little more on the setup wizard. Um, the forms I'm talking about doing manually are listed here in, in number one. So if I was going to deploy a new cabinet, I would set up the forms listed in number one there manually, unit data, permissive channel pairs, that's a conflict matrix. Some of the other um, forms may or may not be even needed. I would run the setup wizard. It's going to complete the six forms listed in item number two, write it to the key, and we are ready to go. So most programming errors I've found are in the forms listed in number two, the ones that the wizard will do for you. So if you give the wizard the proper inputs, accurate inputs, it will generate very accurate programming for you. One of the forms in here that's going to be new to most people is setting up load current monitoring. So I think in this overview it's kind of relevant to take a little deeper dive into how do we set up the monitor for doing load current monitoring. So for each channel and each output there is a checkbox to enable monitoring. So the rule of thumb here is quite simple. If you have a signal head attached to an output, you should have load current monitoring enabled. All right. So for each output, we're going to tell um, we're going to tell the the monitor key program whether it should be enabled or not. By the way, the wizard will set that up for us. Again, also for each output, there is what we call a load current threshold. This is the no load threshold. If the monitor determines that the load current has fallen below this value, and by default that's 20 milliamps, the monitor determines that that is a dark signal and it will produce a fault, lack of signal fault, meaning dark approach, analogous to a NEMA monitor uh, telling us we have a red fail. So the motorist is not able to see that signal head because it's not getting turned on. So that's our safety issue. We want to detect the dark approach. We want to detect it at the time of the fault. Um, that's all we need to set in here. I think the default of 20 milliamps is probably suitable for all cabinets. Um, we're going to do something with those thresholds in the future. That's why we're able to program them. And that's what I'm referring to here as maintenance monitoring. So. Maintenance monitoring is an interesting um, feature that we're going to get to. Maintenance monitoring means, for example, I have a mast arm that has three signals in parallel for redundancy, and I would like to get an alarm when two of those three signals have failed. Maybe it's when one of the three have failed. Okay, so. Introducing load current monitoring into this cabinet is the first step. We have to have a way to measure load current. What we're missing, I believe, to do full maintenance monitoring, detect outages of signals, is an ITE level type standard that defines how load current performs in our LED signals. Right now, that's up to each manufacturer to determine it may vary with line voltage, with temperature, with age, with brand, with model. All of these things we will need to tighten down a little further into a standard to be able to reliably monitor them. 
Okay, but I believe that's coming in the near future. Um, the other mechanism that's needed is a standardized way to convey an alarm of that type to a controller and get that message to somebody who can act on it. So right now we don't really have a, again, a standardized method for doing that. That should be coming in a future revision of the ATC standard. All right, but this is the premise. We're gonna walk before we run in that sense. Load current monitoring is one of the biggest improvements in the ATC cabinet from the point of view of safety and monitoring. Flashing yellow arrow, I believe we're now in this industry out of the, well, let's test it and see if we like it mode. Um, many agencies are deploying flashing yellow arrow on a very wide scale. In most cases, I believe it's just um, the go-to way to do protected permissive turns. There isn't experimentation anymore. Um, new installations just use it. So that said, and I'm not going to go through the details, but there is a form, again, in Monitor Key software that allows you to configure up to six flashing yellow arrow approaches using any of the 32 possible channels of the CMU. So we're going to detect all of your typical signal malfunctions, lack of signal, multiple signal, clearance faults, things like that. We also have the feature to detect a stuck flashing yellow arrow or the yellow trap on a flashing yellow arrow signal pair. All right. So to boil it down, it's very simple to program a key, develop the data set. We're going to open either open a saved template file or start from scratch on a blank configure the manual forms that I had listed in item number two on a couple slides previous, run the setup wizard, configure the forms. If there are any parameter errors, inconsistencies or warnings or errors displayed by the monitor key program, we'll get those resolved. We tell it to write the data to the key and we're ready to go. This makes changing programming so much simpler, so easy, archiving it, saving it, sharing it, um, whatever you're going to do with it. It's just data now instead of jumpers and diodes. All right, I already talked uh, a fairly bit about the auxiliary display unit, model 2220. Again, it's got 32 channels of LEDs, so we can quickly look at the signal status. We can watch channel cycle, if that's what we're interested in. Um, once we have a cabinet malfunction, we'll see the blue lights come on to help guide us to the channels of interest. And if we push the help button, it will launch the diagnostic wizard that will then further give us, I'll call it the deep dive on what are the faulty channels? Who caused them? Controller, hardware, cabinet hardware. Um, and again, what kind of tips can the wizard offer to help us come to the root cause as fast as we can? We, this is also where we can look at signal voltages, signal currents. We can review the settings of the monitor. Of course, you can't look at a data key and tell what's in it. You have to read it and display it. We'd use this device to do that, and we can look at uh, review past event logs. So it's really a handy device to have in the cabinet. We can do all of the same functionality using a laptop with the ECOM software. This is built into the cabinet, a little more convenient. So this is just kind of a quick overview of the different menu items that you'll find in the display unit. We can look at uh, over on the left is kind of the real-time information. We can look at fault status, the voltages, the currents, cabinet control signals, and the state of the flasher alarms. We can clear the logs, um, 
Over on the right, we can view logs and kind of a short list of the configuration information that we can review. These correspond to the same forms that we saw on the monitor key software. So if I need to know how channels, which channels are enabled for lack of signal, red fail, I would look at the LOS lack of signal enable menu and it would show me all 32 channels, which ones were enabled, which ones weren't. So it's very easy to review the configuration of the monitor, look at event logs while you're standing at the cabinet. Again, I can't overemphasize the diagnostic wizard. For decades, for years, we've been looking at LEDs um, on the front of monitors and trying to make sense of them. They blink, they flash. We've got some LCD displays now that help, but the wizard really uh, resolves the request of, please just tell me in English what's going on and what should I look at and try and fix. So that's uh, provided in every CMU through the auxiliary display unit. Uh, I'll note again the blue status LEDs are quite helpful. If channel 6 is involved in the fault, you'll see a blue light on the front of the load switch corresponding to channel 6. You'll see a blue light on the ADU display. Kind of a trivial point, but it really helps focus attention on the signals that are involved in the fault. So hopefully you take advantage of the diagnostic wizard and um, it helps you do your troubleshooting job. So moving along to the serial interface unit, I mentioned earlier in the architecture diagram, this is the same or similar type device that you find in the NEMA TS2 cabinet. We call it a bus interface unit. This is a serial interface unit. They are not interchangeable. However, the functionality is very similar. So in this case, the controller sends a message to the SIU to drive load switches. The SIU takes that message and drives parallel outputs. If the SIU is installed into the detector rack, it reads the parallel outputs of the detectors and sends a message to the controller with the call and fault status information of the detectors. So this is really just a simple I.O. device, 54 programmable input outputs, four opto-isolated inputs for special signals, PET inputs, things like that. Again, no setup. When you plug the SIU into the appropriate slot, it reads an address from the rack and it knows what function it needs to do. So there isn't any user configuration to be done for an SIU. I'll mention as well that we do offer some software to connect to the serial port that you saw on the front panel. It's very simple. It's not meant for intersection use, but it can be used to troubleshoot Maybe you're repairing or verifying that an input assembly or an output assembly is working correctly. So it provides a simple way through a PC program to monitor what the detector SIU is reading, generate calls, or if you're hooked up to an SIU in an output assembly, we can see what the, what the load switch inputs are or drive those load switch inputs if we want to. So again, it's a piece of diagnostic software that may help troubleshoot or repair input assemblies or output assemblies using SIUs. Finally, we're getting down to the uh, more simple device, the cabinet power supply. Well, it's a simple functional device, but power supplies have gotten fairly sophisticated over the years. This is the basic rack mounted 2216 cabinet power supply. It's a 1U height, 19 inch, very compact. It is all 
modern switching technology, we've incorporated power factor correction and high efficiency into this design. The comes in two different um, two different flavors. One is a dual output. It provides 24 volt power for our load switches, SIUs, and detectors. We have another option uh, to add a 12 volt output. If you choose to run your detector racks on 12 volts in the fashion that TS2 does. There's also a 48 volt supply in the 2216 that powers the flash transfer relays, main contactor, door switches, and all of the, I'll say the cabinet control circuitry. That might even include the cabinet lighting and fan depending on um, what's provided in the cabinet. So this is a very sophisticated, um, modern, power factor corrected, high efficiency power supply. We also make one of the benefits of the ATC cabinet architecture is its modularity. So if you attended any of the overviews or you've looked at the previous overview slides for the ATC cabinet, you'll note that there are various different sizes from a large four-door model down to a very compact pole mountable um, CBD style cabinet. So this power supply, the 2217, is an alternate to the previous rack mounted version I just showed you. It's a more compact, smaller power um, supply meant to go into these smaller CBD style cabinets. So we have two options. One's rack mounted in the larger cabinets, standard cabinets. This one is intended to be in smaller cabinets that don't need as much um, internal power. Same technology, high efficiency switchers with power factor correction. In the case of the 2217, it provides a 24 volt output and a 48 volt output. So finally, the high-density flash transfer relay. This is a product currently made by Struthers Dunn. Again, another advancement in safety and performance. Up until this ATC cabinet, flash transfer relays were large, heavy-duty relays, not hermetically sealed. Um, you might have depending on where you live in the country, you might have run into relays that are full of insects and ant carcasses and things like that. Um, those days are gone. So this relay has a number of nice attributes. Number one, it's very compact. It's sized for our LED loads. It is hermetically sealed. There's some gas inside that prevents oxidation and elements from the environment, moisture, salt, dust, whatever, insects. This is now hermetically sealed, completely closed. You can't see it in this picture, but on the top of the relay is an LED indicator. This relay actually has three sets of contacts inside, two for using, uh, for transferring signals from load switch outputs to flasher outputs, and a third contact that actually only drives the LED. So when that LED is illuminated, we know that the coil is energized and we know that the contacts have actually transferred to the signal state. Our current flash transfer relays, many of them have indicators, but all they tell you is there's voltage across the coil. They don't really help the technician know whether the relay mechanics themselves have failed or the relay has failed to transfer. The coil of the 2205 is powered by 48 volt DC. Okay, so we've removed again AC, 120 volts, everywhere in this cabinet where we could for touch safe, um, technician safety kind of reasons. 
the 48 volt supply in the 2216, 2217 power supplies provides this 48 volt supply to drive not only the splash transfer relay, but also the main contactor. So big improvement in a device that we rely on to take over control of the signals when a malfunction occurs and the cabinet goes to flash. As important as the flasher is, if the flash transfer relays are not maintained and operating, again, when we come to that day that a malfunction occurs, we want the intersection to be in flash. We need something as reliable as possible to ensure that happens. I'll talk a little bit about at the beginning of the presentation. I mentioned that the ATC cabinet is designed from the onset to be both 120 volt powered, conventional, and migrate to a 48 volt low voltage type system. So in terms of protecting technicians from high voltages, there are agencies that are spending considerable amounts of money to suit up their technicians in what we call moon suits, protective gear because of the high voltage in a cabinet. So we've gone to great lengths in designing these ATC cabinets, first off to protect technicians or other engineers interested in routers or controllers, things like that, from accidental contact to high voltage points. The move to low voltage, though, ensures that if you have a cabinet that doesn't even have high voltage in it, we've now made that a much safer cabinet from the perspective of shock hazard or accidental contact. So it's envisioned that one of the motivations for an agency deploying these low voltage, 48 volt based cabinets will be in the sense of both technician safety and motorist safety. If there's an accident, a pole gets knocked down, field wires will be 48 volts and not 120 volts, right? So an integral part of the ATC cabinet design was to design this cabinet from the start to accommodate either high voltage or low voltage operation. So by simply moving a few wires within the cabinet, replacing some of the high voltage components with low voltage components, you can produce a low voltage 48 volt cabinet. This will help agencies as they make the transition from 120 to 48 volts. Cabinet inventories can remain the same. New cabinets that are procured from the factory as 48 volts will be identical to any other 120 volt cabinets other than the components and the power connections. So rather than add on as an afterthought, low voltage operation, it's designed into this cabinet from the beginning. So different agencies will have different motivations for thinking about or deploying low voltage cabinets. It may be the touch safer, technician safety issue. It may have to do with licensing issues, citizen safety, all kinds of different reasons. That's gonna be something that your agency needs to think about and make some decisions for. I'll add to this that there are already several LED manufacturers that are providing 48 volt DC compatible signal heads, red, yellow, green, arrows, peds, countdowns, all of the various um, configurations that we need to outfit an intersection. So low voltage ATC cabinets are kind of a look to the future. There are several deployments around North America right now, um, but I believe it will be an item of interest in the very near future. So that concludes the webinar, the overview of the ATC cabinet components. These are all the devices that we will plug into an ATC cabinet. Again, I will thank you very much for attending. Um, I will also encourage you to take a look at some of the material that I um, 
mentioned at the beginning, if you want an overview of the whole cabinet itself, design goals, safety goals, things like that, there's a lot of material available, not only on the Everly Design website, but on your um, OEM cabinet manufacturers, websites, and, and so forth. So we'll open up the webinar to questions. Um, on your little toolbar there, there's a place to post a question, and uh, we'll see if we can't get some activity there and answer those questions for you. If questions come up after this webinar, feel free to send me an email. You can send it to support at editraffic.com. Give me a phone call. I'm happy to answer any questions that I possibly can and help you understand what I'm calling not only the cabinet of today, but the cabinet of the future. This is in fact, in many ways, the cabinet that we have all been talking about for decades and I believe it has a very bright future for us all. So thank you again and we'll look forward to some questions. How long was it? 50 minutes. 50? Oh, perfect. 52? Yeah, perfect. <laughs>